but we'll go and maybe uh, even zoom in here and there. Um, and Charlotte, don't worry if uh, the Wi-Fi starts to crap out a little bit. I'll, I'll take a few more steps and come back. This is one of my favorite places in here uh, with this out here. Ah, in fact, my zooming isn't zooming. All right, well, there it is out there. Um, we'll, we'll have a close-up picture of it to look at later. Uh, this is a ceramic head. And we're gonna see how some of these get made. Uh, we'll have a discussion of the work. We'll have a discussion of um, demo, you know, how, how it's actually created. And, and then we'll look at a number of works and then we'll have demonstrations at the end. Oh, look, who's that over there? Um, that's, a, that's a four foot piece that I pulled out of that storage shed yesterday, just so someone would be out there and back for us. Um, Okay, so we'll look around a little bit around some of these outdoor works. Uh, these are, th this is a head. I was in a workshop with Tip Toland, if anybody knows Tip, and uh, created this several years ago. That's Tip style to have these shoulders, sort of head and shoulders pieces. This was sort of a homage piece I created uh, some many years ago. Does anyone know the work of Stephen Destabler? He was a California artist. I'm a California guy way back. Um, so it's different from anything else I've done, but I do love it. It never really got shown, but here it is. A little bit broken, but I do love that piece. Um, what else is out here? It's kind of wanted to give you a sense of how we live with sculpture, which, which is anywhere and everywhere. We'll go inside in a little while and you'll see more. This is a bronze piece that is, that's not its normal home, but I think she's lovely and a good way to enjoy the spring. What else is here? That's a life-size, um, well, I'll take that question in just a sec. This is a life-size Raku ceramic figure. I created it in two halves and, uh, he sort of st stands there. He's got a poem written around him. Um, his middle. Anyway, you'll see you'll see a lot of experimentation here. Things that that I've moved away from or on from over over time. But um, that's part of the fun of coming on a studio visit, isn't it? That piece that was my Stephen Destabler style over here is all clay. So that piece is created with um, just slabs, slabs of clay. And then I, I, I sort of sp sprayed on, splashed on um, minerals, which have these pigments in them, and, uh, and then fired it. So that's how that piece is, and it's, those slabs, this is what the joy of the clay I use, it's called paper clay. Those slabs are just, um, then there's like poles that go up and they kind of strap in there. And, and those three sections sit on top of each other. All right, let's see. I'm gonna get my videographer out here. Um, and she's gonna follow me into the studio and then we'll look at some pieces in there. Okay, nope. There goes the cat. Miles, <laughs> just leave her, leave her on, should be fun. Okay, so you can, I'm gonna get in front of the camera. And hi everybody, glad to have you with us, come on in. All right. What are we looking at in here? We're gonna have a, a slow pan around and uh, look at some of the pieces that are in here. And it's just kind of random. Some are being created. Some are sort of here while I figure out what to do with them. And that happens a lot. I think what you can see, I don't think it, it doesn't shrink in that I've been able to see on, but what you can see this is, I love this space. I hope you love this visit today. It is a 26 by 26 foot, um, like a um, 
Oh, you're gonna you're gonna get to see a little domestic scene there. <laughs> so, Sorry. So the son takes the cat back in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the cat likes to go out. Well, it's all fun here. Um, uh, it's like a greenhouse uh, with one wall, um, and then and then these low these low um, half walls around, and then all an all glass ceiling. You can see the ceiling there, and. Um, while on a on a super sunny day it may be almost too bright in here but on the you know whenever there's a little cloud cover it's a lovely environment to work in where things are illuminated from all sides so we really we really love having this as a place to work um why don't we start in this corner and look at a few pieces you'll see most of my work has always been representational and figurative um although we'll be looking at some wall reliefs which is something i've been doing the last few years um, these are just pieces that were studies and they're betwixt and between and trying things out, different patinas or working out for a bigger commission or something like that. This is a kind of an interesting um, uh, <coughs> patina, which is a, a coated kind of mirror finish that I used uh, from some, from a, a local vendor, but I don't know. It, you have to try, I, I mean, I've tried a thousand different things. This is a, uh, Example of Raku, which we did a lot of here some many years ago. <laughs> they don't do so much anymore. And then some dripped paintings, a painting that went on top of it, um, a bronze head. Um, yeah, love her. Um, and then various forms. This is this one here is. Um, Wood fired a kiln up in Cold Spring, New York. Um, that's Tony Moore's kiln. If anybody is a wood firer or ceramic person, you should know about Tony and his really beautiful environment up there in the Morigama Anagama kiln up on the top of a mountain in Cold Spring. This is about an hour no north of the city. Um, I've been using, and we'll actually see a little bit more of this later. This this fluorescent magenta patina, um, working that out. Um, and then this is a gold leaf patina, sort of a, a, gilt, a gilt ceramic um, approach. So lo lots of different things. You're gonna see a variety of them. It's a constant challenge. What's over here? Um, these are actually two of our newest pieces. Um, the, these masks, or three, uh, these mask pieces here, so these literally came out of the kiln yesterday. Um, and some of you might have seen her on Instagram uh, when, she, when it was wet clay. Uh, this, so it's not a very big head. And I would be figuring out a patina to bring, to bring life back into it. This is what's called bisque, which is clay that's just been fired. Um, and uh, so obviously in lockdown, we have lots of time. Uh, to be in the studio. This is this is a little bit more of, of a departure for me in the sense of being kind of a kind of abstracted a little bit, and and this will get some probably more interesting colors as a result. Speaking of interesting colors, this is actually a cast um, portrait, sort of a portrait head that I worked on a few years ago with encaustic. This coloring comes from encaustic. Um, and uh, let's see what else over here. Let's turn around. And see, these three heads are just coming together as, as a new a focus for me, which is um, of an installation. I'm calling it the conversation. It'll be a general series where different people I think it's mostly going to be Americans, um, are placed in relation to each other. And so we get a, a, I hope, if I do this right, and honey can sort of pan around it so we can view it from different, different angles. But it, um, my goal is to, get, is to get what's happening between these people um, and to kind of get at, get at something of a national conversation that, that is happening and I think needs to happen more. Um, but uh, anyway, I literally just got this one out of the kiln in that firing yesterday. Uh, and I'm pleased it all, it all seemed to kind of bring that feeling of her 
of her hair um, together. This one in the middle is, is actually a kind of doing double duty standing in here in this, in this conversation. This is actually a portrait head of Kate, Caitlin Copenhaver, who's an artist in New York, with whom I'm doing a series um, which is uh, called Co-Portraits. And so I sculpted Caitlin and now she, I'm taking, I've taken this to her and we've been back and forth with it. And she is going to decide how to sort of take her interpretation and add it into this piece. And in Caitlin's case, uh, what she's described, what she'd like to do is to be projecting video and text onto this piece. So that's something, in, or it may, there may be stenciling or something, but she'll be, it'll probably be, become a text-based work about, about her. And so it's a way, these co-portraits are a way of collaborating. We're bringing, it's not just the sculptor sculpting the subject, but really a collaboration. Anyway, these are a study for a, a commission that I have been given a very loose charter uh, to, you know, with, without a deadline by a really well-known collector in New York and Minneapolis who, um, who is interested in heads. He wants, he wants some sculpted bronze heads for his uh, backyard. And he's, we've got this idea of, a, of the conversation between two or three people um, as something that we're going to do. So I'm excited by that. Let's see what else is here. Um, uh, a couple more wood-fired heads over here. And, oh, okay, let's, yeah. let's go over here. Um, here's another one of Caitlin. So she'll have two different heads to work on. This is one with her hair in the way she normally wears it. Um, what's, uh, oh, and I just, I love her. Just love this head. I, I, I still don't, uh, want to ever let it out of my sight. I, I keep her in the studio just for inspiration. Um, this here, this flag, go ahead and back up and, and get a picture. This was a study that I did for a series which is called the Shared Spaces Project. And uh, here's another example of, of a finished piece. This one was done in Chicago, Pullman, Chicago, um, which is on the south side. And it was done with a community of people there. Is this a photograph? This is a photograph of, of that piece. It's actually on metal um, that we did there. And, uh, but, but the idea was, uh, here, if you, it, by the way, can Charlotte, can you confirm everybody? Are we fine? Everybody's hearing me and I'm not just talking to myself? You're not talking to yourself, Bob. We hear you loud and clear. We're on mute so that there's no background noise. Okay, that's fine. And also, if there, uh, honey, can you watch the screen to see if questions come up? Or Charlotte, if you, if I don't seem to catch a question, can you jump in with audio and, and make sure I, I hear it? That's fine. Okay. Um, the idea was to, and you'll see inside some uh, different wall relief sculptures. Um, where I, I figured out a way to sort of make, be spontaneous with, with sculpture, because normally sculpture is not spontaneous. It's, it's just too much work to manipulate material. But I figured out a way to take objects, found objects or 3D printed things, and just press it into soft clay, and then cast this into a single, a single cast. And, um, you know, I, brands and logos and and create something. And then in this case, the ground, the field, these were, I thought of them as cultural landscapes. And one of which was in, in Venice during the Biennale at the Palazzo Mora um, for the last six months and is now in the Seychelles for their biennial. Anyway, these cultural landscape series was a, was a real shift obviously from the heads and, and figures that I've been doing for forever. But I really needed to do it. It felt like a, a great thing to do at the time. and I with this shared spaces, the idea was that I would go out into communities. I went to 10 places around the United States and worked with a local nonprofit. We did one in Pelham, actually. Um, and we did some little square, square pieces, not full flags, and get people from that community to bring objects or choose objects and talk about 
what they wanted and place it and kind of create an own own their American experience and yet get it into the form of of sculpture. So uh, we'll see one inside that was done in Berkeley. That one was done in, in Southside Chicago. Um, it was a wonderful project. Why don't we look at a few images here and then um, we'll go inside. Hun, why don't you go on over and I will actually take this for a sec. So these are some things you didn't get to see. This is because um, we're out of Wi-Fi range, but these are two large heads that are at the front front of the house. Um, this piece was in front of the Katona Library for about a year. Um, that's the piece that's in the back. Um, we're going to, a little bit later, see some of these hands. This is what's called field notes, is the name of these installations, but one of them was at Pelham Art Center. Um, or in earlier this year, late last year, I guess. Um, so we'll actually see one of the elements that, which is a life cast hand come out, come out of that. Um, this is an image of Sybil Charlier, who's a, she and I did the first sort of co-portraits project where in this case, it wasn't a portrait of Sybil, but one that we talked about doing that was based on um, Haitian, um, Pantheon. And so we did three heads together. Uh, this one, this one, which is um, Guede. He was sort of like a, he, she came out of the underworld with his cheap cigars and was a psychopomp taking you from one place to the next. Um, and this was another one that was um, loosely based on uh, Billie Holiday. Uh, there are those images. That was the one that you saw Sybil sculpting. So that was here in this same space. Sybil, Sybil and I traded moved pieces back and forth between her place in Harlem um, and here. This is a, another one that's very recent. The last piece I showed right before the lockdown, uh, which was down in um, Hell's Kitchen and called Gathering, where I life cast these rocks from this property, took sticks that I found from the property. And these um, screen, sort of rocks in screen that were the wall reliefs that mounted on computer stands. And we assembled that all together um, as a sort of an installation with uh, Jackie Davis, who's a curator. She, she and I worked together with my, my materials and her ideas to create this sense of a gathering fire. I love this piece. It's, it's just out of range. But, you know, a head that got broken and I put some paint on it and hung it on the wall. And this isn't, isn't mine, but it's also just around the corner, the other side of the house. It's some Baroque French guy uh, that one of my the places in Long Island City who used to cast for me had this lying around when they went out of business and gave it to me. But I just love, love, and I'm sure I get some inspiration from that Baroque idea. In fact, Sybil and I, no doubt, took some of those ideas and came here with it. Hey, there's Mary Farazza. Mary was the one who brought me to Pullman, Chicago, uh, to work on that shared spaces piece together. We had a wonderful time there. Spend a week in that community, meeting Mary and other people. That's, that's the next door. <laughs> that's, that's right next to the sculptures on our driveway. It's just so pretty this time of year. I had to I had to take that picture. Here's another standing figure um, that's, that I did when I was an art student uh, that sits on our driveway on the way in. There are those heads from the other side. And uh, while I have you here with these things, this was, a, this was El Paso when we were working on shared spaces at the Natural History Museum, or History Museum there in El Paso. You might even see Beto or his wife in the background of that shot. They were there that day having a meeting. This is also a different location in El Paso where we were, we shifted around twice. Um, here for Mary, there's a image of the folks at the peace rally um, that we, where we created uh, that piece and some of the, some of the students that were there 
um, that day. It's a terrific experience. Loved it. Um, and one more while I've got it here. Oh, Berkeley, California. There's some real Berkeley people. Um, and I think Harvey might be on from the Amani School in, Pel in uh, Mount Vernon, but the Pelham Art Center helped me meet them and we did a, one of the Shared Spaces flags, which is now up in their cafeteria um, with the students there. It was, a, it was a really wonderful experience to spend a week in that, um, that environment with those students and with Harvey. All right, let's head in. Um, honey, why don't you uh, grab the camera back and, and uh, we'll go inside. That's one of Wanda's favorites. There's another one. Oh, did you talk about this one? I did. I did. Okay. Yeah. Come on in. Okay. Um, the wall reliefs that you saw there are are not the first time I've worked with wall reliefs. I, I, I started early taking the ceramic pieces and, um, and putting them on these steel backgrounds. So this was a piece that was done for, a, for the headquarters of a, of a tech company in New York. And when they got acquired, um, they called me up and offered me to come and pick it up if I wanted it, which I did, I love this piece. Uh, but you can see this, this, there was a lot of focus in those days on, on patina and texture and the sort of physical, physicalness of, of the ceramic and the steel and the etching and all that um, gold leaf. Here are a few, yeah, you can give it a slow pan. This is one of the early and sort of iconic um, small, wall reliefs when I was first getting getting to grips with what this medium could do. And you see everything from kids toys and pill bottles and logos and printer cartridges and I embedded a little um, head in there. Some other heads that I'd sculpted that pressed it in but you also have the Ken doll and Ray-Bans and iPhone headphones and What's the Ken doll? Mm -hmm. What's the Ken doll? That's Ken, right there. Oh. Yeah. We, uh, we have these gold walls that, that was one of Wanda's greatest ideas. And it turns out these wall reliefs really seem to work well with them. Come on down and let's look at, uh, here's another one. This is, before I was doing the flags, I was really exploring what the possibilities of this medium. And in this case, the sense of emerging and things kind of bursting past plates. It, it let me play with a lot of interesting sculptural form kinds of ideas. And especially because all this is being sculpted inside out and backwards. I'm, I'm sculpting the mold, the clay mold. So those form, that, that's all going in. It really gets you thinking about form because you're having to picture it in inside out and backwards. Um, here's another one which was another approach, a, um, a sort of a, a tarot. This is from the tarot deck, um, the hanged man. Um, the hanged man's meaning, any tarot aficionados out there would, might know, um, has a lot of subtleties, but it often has to do with sort of hanging out, waiting um, patiently while, while you, um, while the universe lines up for you to get on with your next step. But uh, if this is a ceramic figure that, that I did <coughs> for this piece and then placed it in, sort of embedded in with, with this sticks and things from the yard that gets pressed into the clay and so on. So there's a lot of possibilities with this. Here's another one. Okay.
Now over here on the right um, is um, another small piece, but with this idea of, well, I'll let you guys go into the ideas. But I do love these early ones. This was really uh, a, a lot of fun for me in the in the early explorations of what what the possibilities of this were and those that haven't sold. I'm really pleased to be keeping them and living with them, which is part of the treat that you get from coming to an artist studio. Here's another another uh, approach to this medium, which is this one. A uh, it's sort of a barrel form. You look at it a little bit maybe you saw it from the side it's sort of arch and this is it's all one piece and it, it literally is you know a, a single cast but um, then I painted this surface with iron paint and then a, a rusting agent and it creates this sense of of you know our civilization's objects inside of this vessel um, and really exploring um, in a sculptural way, this sort of inside and outside sense. Now this piece here, I really quite love, and it's also new, it was in that show down in Hell's Kitchen at Jadite. Um, and uh, this is this that patina that I, I've come to really love and use a lot, um, which, is, uh, which is the fluorescent magenta over a dark, background. So as so many of my works is a tightness in the modeling of, of face and features and expression and emotion side and then a looseness in, in the hair sort of an abstractive abstractiveness in that. Um, let's look at this piece on the favor over here which is uh, never been shown. It's a, a, little, a little treat for visitors which is the um, I think of it as a either a broken winged angel or a, a single winged angel. Different people have different views of it. Um, and uh, come on up and look at this hand with the vessel in it. This was, uh, this is porcelain and it was sculpted in Tony Moore's, I mean, so it's fired in Tony Moore's wood kiln that I mentioned earlier. Um, the hand, and I have been exploring a lot of different, this is my hand, a lot of different, um, uh, the expressiveness of a hand. And then in that kiln, one of the other potters, uh, because we, you know, we're all, a bunch of us are in that same kiln for a firing. It takes several days of round the clock beating it with wood. But this pot fell off, fell down and landed on my piece. And what first looked like, oh gosh, that's not good. Um, to them, I instantly said, oh my gosh, this is great. Um, and so anyway, it's been a fun one to have around. Come on through here, hon. All right. Um, why don't I take it for a sec? Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's the living sculpture. Um, this is a pose that I've used a lot um, in the past, a sort of seated man, and this is a, a gilt ceramic version of him. Um, a few other masks here, kind of, or heads, wall-mounted heads. That was also wood fired and porcelain and wood fired. Um, I wanted you to see this and then we'll, oh, one of Wanda's favorite. Early, early piece there. That was in a 500 Raku book. <laughs> um, but this, this is one now, can, will it show? I don't know, it's not showing that well, but this is also a Raku cylinder, sort of a tree of life feeling with these heads sticking out of it but oops maybe too light behind it 
Um, and I think we're going to lose Wi-Fi around here, but this is where it's one of my favorite rooms in the house where I sit and read. Don't go any further. And, okay, that's that's the limit of it. Yeah. Okay. So, and I, I haven't. I really don't think I can expand our view of it. Um, but all right. Those are some heads over there, and that wall relief, which which has a, a, a sort of figure in it, the same bronze one from, from outside. And um, all right, so Charlotte, you're saying I can't go any further. I wanted to just look at this Berkeley piece. Maybe not. Are we losing you? I feel like it's a little risky right now. I don't okay. know. Okay. All right. I won't. I won't go any further. Um, well, that's a little bit what it means to live with sculpture. And one that's pointing that's something. Like oh, that guy outside. Yeah, it is. There's sculpture everywhere. This is not a, a this is somebody outside. No, it's, it's just, it's just another one of these standing, standing pieces. It's fun. Okay. So let's go in to the studio, talk a little bit about this body of work, and then show you some of the making steps for it. By the way, this sculpture is useful in your life because there goes our our roommate son. Um, <laughs> think about these N95 masks. I have two of them in the um, studio to keep keep stuff out of my nose. And now we have to we get to use them whenever we go out, and I figure out a way to reuse them and dry them and. Clorox and stuff, and where am I going to hang those up to dry? It's perfect. So there you go. Um, all right, let's let's head back into the studio, and I think we. I want to spend a couple minutes just talking about the ideas that are in this work, and because with sculpture, it's easy to get caught up in the doing and the making. I'm going to let Wanda. Hold this again. But um, the doing and the making obviously matters. It's fun. It's going to be fun to watch too. Um, but ultimately, you know, art is, is about something else, the ideas that are in it. And um, so I wanted to talk about that. Like, why, probably, when you look at what's here, you're going to think to yourself, this is not the kind of work that I'm used to seeing when I go to Chelsea or somewhere else. I'll just pull out a, uh, a quick image. This is an artist that we know, Millicent Young. Uh, Millicent's work is horsehair tied around these um, sticks. And it's beautiful and it's contemporary and it deserves its place on the cover of Sculpture Magazine. Um, but my work has always been different. I mean, it's always, it's always felt I, I love the doing of it. I love having my hands in it, but that's not, that's not it. How are we doing? Good. I, I started to see a finger, but we're good now. Okay. Um, which is, um, uh, so what's behind it? It's not that, that I'm just trying to create heads that look like people. Um, but but rather and, and figures and bodies you know that that was all done so well in the 19th century and 16th century and whatever so much as i do love going and looking at an old houdon or a carpo or something like that and the life likeness of it for me this work is a response to to all those years that i spent as a tech guy um 20 years in tech industry digital everything you know I, I i and i was able to be a pioneer in the digital design world with a, with a design firm in the 1990s but ultimately when i was able to leave that um i felt strongly the need to be in a sort of an organic life affirming environment that was different and away from all that digital digital and artificial world. And so for me, getting my hands into clay and creating human forms 
forms that reaffirmed consciousness and and life and relationship was has been and continues to be the reason that I I, I do this work. Um, so you know it's 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 a weird thing because figures figures work as just design, they work as decoration, they work as something that people feel drawn to emotionally. But in contemporary art world and circles, you know, that may not be enough. And so I'm constantly thinking about how to recontextualize this work so that it actually gets involved with questions that the art world is more interested in and that I'm also interested in. And that's where these collaborations have come in, installations, working with people who, other people, so bringing other viewpoints together into, into the work. All those shared spaces works done with communities um, were all ways to sort of open myself up to a process that involved the input, involvement, and ideas of other people. So that might not be obvious when you look at the work, and so I wanted to spend those couple of minutes just talking about that and why you know, the work isn't just this sort of meditation on material and form, which you know, a lot of artists do and are doing that really well. But because my, my material and forms are traditional ones, um, sometimes it can get misconstrued as simply old fashioned. Um, yeah, let, let me look at some notes here for a sec. It's such a beautiful sentiment, Bob. Thank you so much for sharing that. And yeah, yeah, thanks. I, I also just wanted to comment too about when we had, we had Bob um, as part of the New Rochelle Arts Fest in Pelham that usually happens in the fall. And we had Bob out in the courtyard at the Pelham Arts Center um, making some of these works with people passing by with community members and young people and old people and all sorts of people. Um, it was just a really beautiful, um, a beautiful thing to watch. And that collaboration at the Mount Vernon School, that's one of the schools the Pelham Arts Center also does outreach and free education programming. It was so, we were so happy and honored to have Bob be able to participate and bring this very special project to those students. So. It was just very cool. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Charlotte. Yeah, I think you know a lot. Of, a lot of that is about, it, especially with sculpture. There was this long tradition of the generally guy, you know, the big ego, big guy who makes you know the big mat. Our sculptors have a lot of ego over the years, so um, dismantling that has been really important to my practice and that has meant just sort of being out being open and, and involving and inviting all that kind of um, chance and other voices that that come into the work and of course it's been fun i mean it gets it gets you out i love the studio but but you need to get out and and so so make making it more of a conduit for other ideas all right so let us look at a couple things now. Hun, you want to um, focus on this for a minute? Where, this is a, where's the stand? It's, it's hanging up. It's, it's mounted on, on that piece. Okay. So let us, um, this will be a couple minutes and then we'll shift over to that one. This is a mold and it occurred to me that a lot of people might not have seen a rubber mold before. Um, and it is a mold of a hand of, a, of another artist named Sol Kyok. Actually, Charlotte knows Sol. Um, Sol and I have done some collaborations in the past. And we, um, we wanted to make these hands that then could be hung up in, and create a, a sense of a field, field notes, one that, one that uh, was actually used there in Pelham uh, recently. So I thought I would show you how, how we cast something. Um, and it's a little bit like a cooking show where I have, I have a, um, a, 
piece that I'm about to show you, and then another one that's like what happens after you bake that thing for a half an hour, whatever. All right, so we will we'll have this, and I'll mix up a little plaster. Put a little spray in there. What kind of spray is that? This is, this is like Pam for, for your uh, kitchen. It's called mold release, and it essentially just lets lets the, the plaster kind of come unstuck a little more easily later. All right, so then I will come on over and get a... So I've just put a little water in here. We'll get a little plaster in it. You know, sculpture is fun. It's like all that stuff you got to do in craft class back when you were in elementary school or whatever. And some, everybody knows the term plaster of Paris. It's kind of, you know, that's what, what it is. So we just take some plaster, mix it in with water. I use different kinds of hydrocal. It's not called plaster of Paris, what I use, but this is harder, harder and better for sculpture. Put that in there. Let it sit for a bit. I like to add a little something to my to my plaster, which is ground Carrara marble. Um, this comes from the quarries that Michelangelo and all those Greeks and Romans have used for millennia up in the, in the coastal area of Tuscany. And it changes a little bit how the light refracts off of the, the plaster in the finished piece, but it also connects us to this long lineage. So then, Kitchen mixer. So Mary and Harvey, who were both involved in shared and, and probably uh, maybe Charlotte too. Anyway, we would know about all this mixing. We spent a lot of time mixing plaster on those flag projects. Um, but uh, I'm just gonna put these up here, kind of something to prop this up against. And yeah. So then you just take that, pour it in. Now I always have to slosh it around, trying to get those air bubbles to come away. Get down into all those fingers. I'll fill it up. Okay. Good. All right, so that's basically done. Now, just like those cooking shows, the little clock goes half an hour later. Um, this is what I did yesterday. So we'll open it up. It's kind of fun to open oh, these is up. It oh, I thought it was bubbling. Well, there are bubbles that come up on top of the, of the plaster. And I just try to shake them so that they they come out. So this is this was actually my hand, um, and that we had the male hand and the female hand as two components of the of the field notes insulations. And then we 
colored, they're colored in all kinds of different ways. All right, so here the, this is the mother mold is this sort of outside part. Just like this one. Say that again? Just like this one. Yeah, this is just, is just like that one. And the mother mold is the kind of um, form that keeps the, the rubber part um, all in, you know, keeps it in the right shape. Now with, with casting, you quote, you really never quite know what you're going to get. So we hope we got a good cast each time, but we're never, you know, it takes a while to get to know a mold to make sure you've really got it down. So this is the first time you're opening it? This is just opening now. I have done this year, you know, a few years ago. I, I use this mold a lot to make those pieces, but I haven't used it in a while. Um, so that's the first half of this thing. And you see, there's always a little, we like to make messes in here. My, my most wonderful thing about this, preparing for this with you, Charlotte, and all of you was that I got to clean up my studio, which I hadn't really had a good reason to do in a long time. <laughs> um, so that can be your, your uh, sales pitch to, to other artists. All right, let's see here. And it, it's, it's tricky because the hand is, the hand was like this and it's easy to crack these fingers when I take this mold off. And these hands, these are what we had in the installation in November and December and the collectibles and the artisan boutique was happening at the Pelomart Center. And I think we, how many are there? Maybe 24 of them? Um, I, ha I had a number, I forget exactly, but you know, I have had, I've, yeah. Um, it's just like as many as you want for the space that, that you're filling. It's just, it's just range and, and it's, well, go ahead. You, you describe how it felt to you, Charlotte, to have, to have all those different hands up there, just kind of floating quietly up in the. Um, yeah, floating, floating quietly. Or I, I just, I loved the drama it created in our arched space in our small gallery um and the brightness of just breaking up something just having the hanging sculpture is a little more unusual um yeah and we had a really nice response to it good um i love i love getting things the, the english used to say uh, by the way you can see i this cracked off It'll, that'll be easy to repair but i was trying to avoid that um there it is. Hey, does that look familiar? Um, <laughs> so, uh, getting off the plinth is was a sort of a theme for a lot of sculptors. I remember Anthony Gormley giving a talk in London that that I was able to go to that they, the British call sculpture stands plinths. Um, get off the plinth. So you know you can look up here and see some of these hanging pieces, but or things that go directly on the ground or something, but um all right so that was a uh, that's that sort of casting thing we actually i just actually had this mold made um this this week i'll take this for a sec um of um it's this it's this head of caitlin's head so it's it's that head um i have a mold maker in gumbo put on my mask and went over there and made and had her make this mold so I, this is the first cast I've done. And as I said, when you're making casts, you got to learn about them. So where, where, where they go wrong. And I did open this up earlier. Um, and there is a little bit of a flaw in it, but it's still pretty good. So go ahead and hold that. And so I had like what you saw before. And, you know, th these sections come off. If this is bolted together, um, has about half dozen bolts, and then you spend a lot of time peeling this away. And so we have here it is. This is the inside of that. Rubber molds can get very big. 
Um, so we have a pretty good cast except for this chin. So, um, and then there are lots of little things, but that's actually something that I can touch up and fix. Um, and the, the, the bottom half of this is gonna take some time to get it out to this mold comes apart in another spot. And um, this will be some work, but I'll get working on this one um, later this, this weekend. And uh, so it shows just another something to see. Now I thought I'd show you in the last few minutes that we have uh, how to make a head. Um, okay, so let's see. Come on over here. And this is how these heads start. It's just a, a pole. And I. Who's that out there? What's that? Oh, oh, who's that out there? Yeah, that's that piece out there. Um, all right, so I just take um, a newspaper and I, I wrap it up on top of the head. And I put some tape around it. And then we'll put clay on next. So that's all newspaper underneath? It's just this is just news this is just a ball of newspaper. Um, so you can actually do this at home. And then it'll take you 20 years to get these heads, <laughs> heads to look the way you want them if your experience is like mine. Okay, so let's take this over. And um, ah, yeah. I'll do it here. Um, then I take a bag of clay. This has been a wonderful thing to have during a lockdown. I have to tell you, I just come out every day and, you know, it's just beautiful work to be able to forget and get, get some space for what's going on out there. Uh, so I take this and then um, just give the, the floor a little dust. You don't want to get stuff in there. And then I smack it down. That makes a slab. Otherwise, I can use this slab roller here, which is kind of a fancy way of doing what I just did. I'll take this and do the same thing. This paper clay is, a, is really wonderful. It, like, it gives me a little more, it's just, it's just easier to work with. It's regular clay, but it has some paper fiber blended into it and, it, and it's just much more forgiving. And uh, Bob, can you talk while you, while you mentioned the clay a little bit about what kind of kilns you have on your sure. property and what types of, like the paper clay, I didn't know that that was, a type of clay okay. through a regular kiln? Um, yeah, sure. Um, let's see what I've got here. Um, I have I have two different kinds of kilns on the property, which are, again I think we get we get out of range of the Wi-Fi. But in this metal shed out here are two um, regular electric kilns. Um, one's a big oval, and one's a sort of a more like an 18 inch. And then um, on the other side of the property are some gas kilns that are where I do the raku. And those have propane tanks that drive them. And uh, um, but those are for faster kinds of firing. The electric's beautiful because it has um, it has an electronic controller. So you just program it and 
take off. You know, it, it really solves, it, it does it all a lot by itself. Paper clay, the beauty of paper clay is that bigger, more complicated sculptural kinds of forms can dry out um, without having to be so coddled. They, they, they dry out without cracking better and you can go thicker and fire thicker without problems that would, that would blow up a regular kind of a clay. So it just lets more air get in there. Um, now this, what I'm putting on here is called slip. Slip is just the same clay I'm using, but I mix it with water and I blend it up with that blender and it makes it into a kind of, a, so it's kind of like glue for clay. When you get up to, you know, the 2000 degree range, it sort of helps vitrify or melt and make um, better seams. So slipping and scoring, any ceramics person's probably heard that. That's what I'm doing here. The scoring is with this very high tech tool from the kitchen. And um, so then I can take this second slab and sort of mush it up in there. And that'll get us, you know, because you can't always get it all in one in one piece. So I spend some time kind of working these two back into each other. And then I take this other high tech tool which is a, a hunk of lumber. And clay actually responds very well to this kind of beating. It, it seems to sort of jostle and line up the clay particles better. So they actually can be stronger than if you, oops, <laughs> I think I just hit one with a spot. Um, it's good clean clay. All right, so that you can imagine now gets pulled up. And I'll work on that and that'll be the next, the next head I do. So then a minute later, it'll be in this shape. Now I've let this sit overnight because generally that, that clay, the one that I just made, isn't really ready to get worked on yet. It, will, it would be a little too soft and a little too unstable if I started to really work on it. So now, you have wanted to follow me, I, I'm basically bringing this into form and I'm using yet another high-tech tool, which is a putty knife. And, you know, one of the things with heads is symmetry. So you're always trying to be aware of symmetry. And something that a lot of people don't know, but you can test it out in front of the mirror. If this is an eight inch head, where would you think the eyes would be in the middle of the eyes? Most people will always get them too high, but right about the halfway mark is generally where the middle of the eyes are. And it always seems like it's low for people. But um, I'll keep puttering away, but if people want to ask questions, maybe this is the right time to open it up. I think that's a great, a great time to open it up for questions. And Bob, throughout this, you had also mentioned that you're a California man and art school a little bit. Can you just tell us where you're from originally and where you studied? Right. So, yeah, I was born and raised in California in the Bay Area, which is just, um, I just, Berkeley, right over the hill from Berkeley. And then I went to school at Berkeley and MIT, um, where I studied innovation. And then um, I, did, I went and spent several years at, when I got to sculpture, when I, when I, it was 20 years ago that I finally found my way to sculpture full time. Um, I went to the Art Students League of New York, which is a, a great school 
it for older students because it's called an atelier method. It's it's not classes so much as it is you just go in the studio and you just work with a with a professor's teacher who's also an artist, and you just spend years almost like an apprenticeship. Great. They also have a place over in Rockland County, where I know you're from, Charlotte. Wait, um, Mark, um, someone just had a question um, about, I couldn't finish reading it, something about your hands. Can you repeat that, whoever posted that? Oh. Um, how are your hands doing? Seem, seems like that could become a real challenge with all the forceful grip needed when working with clay. How are oh. you? Um, <laughs> <laughs> my, hands, my hands are great, but you know what? I use CBD oil. <laughs> no. He uses CBD ointment every night. I mean, it's always, it, it hurts. It, it hurts. Um, soaking them in Epsom salts, hot, hot water and Epsom salts is good. Our drummer son, who we caught a glimpse of in there, um, who, who would be out on tour right now all over the country with his band, but they're in lockdown. So he's with us. He showed me, he has got this bath of paraffin that's kept at, at kind of a hot temperature and you dip your hands in that and let it sit and cool. That's, that's pr pretty nice. Volterran is another great product. It's basically Advil in a tube and you rub it on your hands and that, and then, um, or CBD oil cream. Oh, it's, good. So it, far. it's so yeah, beautiful he, being a sculptor. There's yeah, just he doesn't really take a, he doesn't really take Advil or anything like that very much unless he's, really in a lot of pain but otherwise you just cbd ointment and it, like you made it look so easy bob but i know that those um those plaster molds are really heavy that one that new one you got that you just opened up like yeah those, yeah, those are very heavy you know this sculpture keeps you fit um one of the things that people it's very hands-on it's very it's that's got to be a plus for people if they want to go into sculpture. Um, but um, one of the first things they do in sculpture school, art school for sculpture students is just kind of it's like, you know, here's a drill, uh, there's some wood, you know, make make this, you know, screws are over there, whatever. And you need you you need to be the kind of person who likes to like hop on and grab a saw and you know, make things work. For me that's that's a plus, um, but I, I know a, lo a lot of painters are, are sort of in a different mode. They're, you know, for them, it's, it's much more about the imagery and the, and the direct from the brain. Yes, there's the moving of the brush and the paint, but not, not that much more. Is there another question? What, the school in Rockland County? That you were about to mention something. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that is now closed, sadly. But the Art Students League had a branch up there called Bitlichill Campus um, that is um, in Spark Hill. Spark Hill. That, that's literally like two minutes from where I grew up. Um, I know. I know. I love it over there. It, it, and I spent years going over there, you know, multiple times a week. But they couldn't really make a go of it. But it was like a kind of like a an art retreat, you know, it was like a artist retreat center. Beautiful. Yeah. And they had just built this whole brand new studio building um, for artists to live and work. And it was an international residency. Yeah. And then yeah. they did just sell it off and close it down. So we're, yeah, we're very that, curious as being a neighbor of what will happen there. As yeah. well. That wasn't like they just closed down because of our current crisis. That was two years ago, three years ago. So. Yeah, it was some years back. Yeah, it's tough. You know, nonprofits, anything in the arts is tough. And that's why I'm so grateful for all of you who are on with us today, for your interest and your support of the Pelham Art Center and for all things art that are going on. I think it's, it's huge. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, this is a good question about some of your highlights from the past year, things you have coming up for the next year. And then I, I want to piggyback on that question a little bit of maybe some of your, your favorite most recent public sculptures. Sure. Um, well, it, being in Venice was a big deal for me. I loved it. Um, and so that was up for six months. Um, and you can look online and see C53, Seascape. 53 was that piece. Um, but um, 
you know, I mean, I had things. I, I, I was supposed to be in the Seychelles right now for the opening of that biennial, but that all got shut. So all these things, you know, art fairs and all this stuff is all being shut down. I was going to be in Denver next month and, and, uh, uh, for the, the public art with the when you did the um the three babies i did i did a little piece in zuccotti park back during the occupy movement that was really fun was called treasury bondage with three life-size babies with chains around them um and um that got some interest I, I, I think having those two aluminum heads, which you saw now, they're in front of my driveway. I had those down um, flanking the entrances to Marcus Garvey Park um, in Harlem. That was, that was great. And that created real friendships in that community um, that, I'm st that are still active. active. Um, I, I have to tell you, Charles, I've been doing smaller pieces lately. The big pieces are expensive and they, it's, great to show them but they don't always sell not everybody has, has them and so at some point i i, I kind of felt like i i gotta i gotta, <laughs> gotta rein myself in a little bit on the size the forklift rentals you know <sighs> anyway i believe me i know when we would install some public art on our arch the art center yeah. you know renting construction equipment and then how do you drive it and how do i get 20 feet up in the air and yeah, it's yeah, that's right. I remember that part that of the you had over there. Yeah. 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 You just never know. Um, never know what's going to be next, I guess. Um, keep going with the questions. I'm, I'm just in my happy place right now. So I, I, I keep doing this um, for a while. <laughs> this one is not yet a, a person in particular. I'm just kind of blocking in, um, you know, fairly general uh, planes in, in, um, and working at, at keeping it symmetrical as it goes. But um, you make me really want to get back into some kind of art studio. We had a wonderful drawing workshop yesterday on proportions of the human head. And it's so neat to be watching this the next day where we see it come to life in three dimensions. Um, Alas, poor Yorick. You know, I mean, the Art Students League was really good at, at really getting you to the foundations it was it was classic style art where with the live model and um you know know your anatomy it was a he heavy figurative component to it down there um this is uh not a real skull i mean it's a cast of a skull but you know you spend a lot of time my jaw is a little loose here sorry about <laughs> but um you spend a lot of time really really looking at the anatomy and when you do you know it, it makes the work it makes it stronger, so. Absolutely, you can always, those, those basics come in handy everywhere, absolutely, for art knowledge. Um, yeah. I thought I'd share too if, that I met you in your Chelsea studio. Um, so do yeah. you want to talk about that second space? Sure, you were, yeah, Charlotte, uh, when you were at uh, Rush Arts, you were right down the, down the hall. Um, for several years now, I've had space um, in Chelsea in one of those nice old art buildings, 526 West 26th Street. Um, and an old friend, Arlene Rush, no relation to Rush Arts, um, who's had that studio space for 20 some odd years. So I, sh I had a couple walls in that space and I've been using it to just do demonstrations, show people work, bring in curators or collectors who happen to be in New York. We're 45 minutes outside of Manhattan here. For those of you who are not Westchester people or this area, know this area. Um, and while we love it and all these trees, which I hope you've, you've found, figured out is just a wonderful place to live. Um, you know, a lot of people won't come out here. If they're in New York, they'll come to 26th Street, but they won't come out here. So that's been useful. I am giving up that space, so I don't have it uh, as of soon. But um, I'll find another place, maybe in Harlem, uh, so that I can have um, that kind of place in the city and also be able to do some portraits and stuff down there. Bob, where are you getting the metal stands made, the pedestals? Uh, I designed these and I have a welder, local guy um, from the Dominican Republic, who is just terrific. He's a magician in steel. And he's made a lot of different things for me over the years to support 
support the sculptures in some different ways. Um, and I really have learned early, as you probably saw with that relief, wall relief in, in by the kitchen, that steel and, and ceramics and glazes go well together, I think. Um, but this is my newest design. I'm really happy with this. It's four posts. It, it's light. You can sort of see through it. And yet it also brings us up and kind of stands in a little abstractly as human form and brings these heads up to our level. So I think that's, um, that's been really helpful. So we are going to have to wrap it up in a few minutes and we've gone a little over, but that's, that's okay with me. One more question. Um, I'm just reading from the comments. Speaking a little more about the symbolism, political or social commentary, uh, yeah. even in the most simple, seemingly figurative pieces. And what are you thinking about for inspiration and upcoming work? Um, good. That's a great question. Thank you. Um, I think for me, um, it's first of all, it's, it's about Americans um, and America. Um, it's probably a very, it's just about me reaching out past whatever it is I'm familiar with. So if I'm familiar with it, it's kind of off limits. If I'm not familiar with it, I'm interested and I think it becomes a suitable subject to explore. I want to do it with other people, it won't just be me driving it. Um, I have a few older men in there. I've been interested in old, older guys because I'm starting to look down that, that uh, avenue. Um, but I think, I think uh, you know, the things that happen to you psychologically and physically uh, as you get older, which are, are starting to be interesting to me. Um, but uh, yeah, just to try to get it at a diverse, different ways of being, uh, being uh, Americans. Yeah. Interesting. It's mostly heads. I think it's mostly going to be heads for now. For, for the foreseeable future. The, the bodies and models are not, it's not, not that interesting. Uh, you know, I'm not driven to do things there, but I feel like heads, at least for now, have all kinds of possibilities and let me focus on the stuff that I'm, I'm interested in. Do you do a lot of work with or without models? For years, that was the, you know, the training, all my training was always with the model. And I, I had a hundred models here um, over the years, often from people, students at SUNY Purchase, which is nearby here. Um, and just, they were just wonderful uh, ways of getting to know these students and so on. Um, but those were mostly figure models. Those are when I was doing the whole body because to do a face model, you know, it has to be that person. So um, I've been, since I'm doing fewer figures, I'm doing fewer models, but but I'm thinking for these heads, it's going to be collaborations with other artists. Um, and that, then that person will, in effect, be that model for those heads that, that they're doing. These are from photographs. This is from life. And um, I have some other artists that are, are queued up for here as soon as we, we would have been doing them already if it were not for this lockdown. Do you uh, want to get the name of this model? Uh, Ilarica Johnson. It's the name of that model. We saw her on a really great TV series. <laughs> She's an actor. She's an actor. Um, you can look her up. But anyway, the, the TV series was a, called A Discovery of Witches, which is, a, which is kind of Harry Potter for grown-ups. <laughs> Got to binge a little on these lockdown. <laughs> um, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Bob, for sharing. Um, your work and your home and your art studio with us. It's been really fantastic. Um, we are planning three more visits with artists next week. Um, so if anyone would like to find out more information, we'll be posting it on our website later today. Um, definitely by tomorrow. And Bob, do you have anything you want to kind of close out with? Um, thanks for being, thanks really all of you for being there. Do we get a, is, are, were you recording any of this? Is there a, a Actually, link? I did. I oh, wonderful! For this, yeah, I, I'm new at this, so I'll I'll figure out how to get it to you. Yeah, it'd be great to have it, and maybe if anyone who was on today 
wanted to share it with a friend or something, you know, we'll get word out about where that, where that is and where that was. Um, but I really am grateful to all of you uh, for being here and I hope that it helped pique your interest a little bit in sculpture. Um, there are lots of adult education kinds of things out there for sculpture um, and ways to see it. Uh, sculpture Magazine is, is really the only sculpture magazine, I think. But it's good. Um, why not? Why not get yourself a, subscrip a subscription? Um, it's um, sculpture. Well, National Sculpture society. society has a magazine too. Yes, that's is that Jackie? Yes, it is. Hi, Bob. Hey, your voice. <laughs> wow, Jackie and I were students together. Gosh, almost twenty years ago, maybe. In um, thank you. Wow, wonderful, wonderful. Well, I'm glad you're here. Um, yeah, that's right. That's right. There is there is the National Sculpture Society for, for figurative kinds of, of things. And, and um, so anyway, well, great. Thanks all. And thanks, Charlotte, for pulling us together. <laughs> great. Thank you so much, um, everyone, for being here. And yes, if you can, um, think about your local nonprofit art center. And if you can support them in any way through a membership um, or engaging in their virtual programs right now, all of that is greatly appreciated. We also have our 70s logo um, for the Palmar Center t-shirts and those are on sale on our website if you know anyone who needs a cool vintage logo t-shirt. Um, anyway, thank you so much. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, bye. Bye. We'll bye, talk, Bob. Bob. <laughs> All right.